Good afternoon, dear members, ladies and gentlemen, students. Hope everybody is refreshed after a nice lunch and not trying to fall asleep. Probably the only food in the world that you can identify with the sound and not the smell or taste. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about resilience, resourceful, resourcefulness, and uh, revival, starting with something we are all very familiar with, kottu. So somewhere in the 80s, uh, the eateries in the eastern province started to see that they have a lot of leftover godam roti. Godam roti, for the youngsters who don't know it anymore, it's one big flat roti, it's just plain flour and oil. So that was the famous evening food meal back then. There was no kuttu. So uh, they have started to have a lot of this leftover. Probably maybe the uh, insurgences and all of that had a role in that because probably the shops had to close earlier. So they started to find an innovative way to stop this food waste and how to recycle the food so that it can be used again. And kuttu was born. So today, of course, kottu is known as a, a signature Sri Lankan dish. If you go to YouTube, all the YouTubers are trying it. They are putting all their reviews. It's supposed to be the food to have if you are traveling to Sri Lanka. So what do we have to learn from kottu? Um, it's about using something, uh, a challenging circumstance or a challenging situation, and to try and make something innovative out of it so that you do something even better. So Godam Baroti, nobody knew. Godam Baroti never had the Sri Lankan signature dish status, but the recycled Godam Baroti became Kottu, and that's known all over the world now. So something like this is probably what the practice of architecture needs to do in terms of the uh, chaotic situations that we've had in Sri Lanka over the past years. So I've got a little uh, discussion and a personal experience to share with you. Part one is about my personal experience running a practice over here. So we started in 2008, 15 years ago. From 2008 up to 2024, it's always been uh, chaotic. It's been crisis after crisis. So 28 to 2010, we had the fourth Elam war. Bombs everywhere, people dying, all sorts of horrific news, and uh, obviously the first two years was just that. We didn't do anything at all. In fact, we also had to have other employment just so that we could survive, rather than running the practice. So it's been 15 years filled with crisis. After that, uh, from 2010 onwards, we had a so-called little bit of honeymoon post-war honeymoon period. Uh, things started to pick up a little bit. Some of these projects, we have uh, taken through those crisis periods as well. So Columbus City Center, we started in 2013, uh, just after the war, um, during the honeymoon period. But of course, then it went through to the other crisis stages as well as a project. Then this is uh, Monarch Imperial, which is another one of our projects. We started that just before the uh, uh, Easter Sunday attacks, probably a few months before that. Again, from Easter Sunday attacks to two years of pandemic to the economic crisis, all these projects have to have had to face all of that. And this is another one of our projects, again started in late 2018, uh, just as Sri Lanka was hitting a political crisis. This was before the Easter Sunday attacks, we had some, something called the 50 days cabinet, and the entire government went into chaos, and a lot of uh, investors pulled out, but certain projects just had to pull through. The grind was on. So 2022 came. We've experienced everything by then. We've experienced war, pandemics, uh, terrorist attacks, you name it, we've experienced all of that, but we've never experienced a financial crisis. We didn't know exactly what th this was. In fact, we thought living through 30 years of war, we had seen everything. But 2022 showed that 
there was more to come. So the project terminations were as if a light, light switch was switched off. There were project suspensions, skyrocketing expenses, even running a practice or just surviving. And of course, talent migration throughout different industries, not just architecture. Every industry had talent migration happening just like that. And businesses were absolutely desperate to survive. So by this time, by middle of 2022, we knew that something had to happen, or not just ourselves, the practice would die, obviously, but people would lose jobs, and something had to be done. What we tried to do was to look at this as an opportunity and to see what could we do to survive and maybe to turn this into an opportunity. All the management gurus, uh, business uh, advocates, people who talk about business would talk about creating opportunities out of nothing. So we thought for a change as architect, we'll also try and see whether we could do that. So we started to look at reinvesting and reinventing things and to see uh, whether we could approach a planner strategy to do that. So it came into five key points that we tried to uh, use, starting with expansion, diversification, team strengthening, collaborations and alliances, and of course, exceptional, ter ter ex exceptional service to our clients during a time of crisis. I'll just quickly take you through each of these points. So expansion, what we tried to do was rather than being in our, this cocoon of Sri Lanka, very comfortable, very uh, nourishing, but when times are tough, we have to see whether we could expand. So we tried to take our operations out to the UAE and to kind of uh, see whether the Middle East and the Northern African region is an opportunity, and also then to see Australia, whether that could also be another opportunity. So we, we expanded uh, westward to UAE and the Middle East and eastward to Australia. Then diversification, so uh, just being a pure design practice sometimes wouldn't be enough. So we tried to see whether we could diversify into other areas of uh, expertise using our skills and uh, uh, the talented team that we had. Uh, going into turnkey interior design projects was another avenue that we explored. Team strengthening, so this was one of the key things that we had to do. There was so much talent migration happening in every industry. We need to look at having a proper cohesive team and to having a uh, in kind of um, uh, inclusive workplace so that the decision-making processes were changed. There was more inclusion from the teams in that. We looked at uh, creating uh, opportunities to work on international projects so the team members are getting valued international experience while staying in Sri Lanka. And of course, we looked at increasing uh, remuneration. So these key uh, activities we almost immediately started. Then finally, collaborations and alliances. So this is another key way of uh, surviving. If you can't survive together, team up with other people who are also drowning. You, you could probably get together and not drown. So the idea was to see whether we could find like-minded individuals, like-minded corporates who could team up, collaborate, have alliances that could bring more synergy into each other's businesses. Finally, the exceptional service to our clients. Since this was such a bad crisis period, what we have understood right from the outset is that our clients were also going through the same problems that we were going through. In fact, some, in, some, in some instances, those were far worse situations. So what we tried to do was, wherever we could, to provide exceptional service at a time where other businesses are cutting down costs, losing staff, uh, making uh, redundancies, we try to somehow manage and give exceptional service to our clients. So with these five strategies kind of uh, activated in the last one and a half to two years, by middle of last year, we started to see some glimpses of revival. Sri Lankan economy was stabilizing, 
Similarly, our efforts in making things happen were also starting to uh, get some results. So what I'm going to show you next is just a very tiny, minute, small glimpse of revival of things resurging back again. I'm going to show a few images of a few projects that we are doing at the moment. None of these projects are finished because they all started probably within the last six months. But as a result of the things that we've done more than a year before that. So these are a few of the projects that I'm going to share with you, but I will go into the images so that it's easier. So that's a, a residential project we are doing in uh, Melbourne right now. It's a, a French provincial style residence as requested by the clients, but brand new set of regulations, brand new way of building. We had to learn a lot of things, unlearn a lot of things, and uh, starting to get a little bit of results from that. Another project uh, in Melbourne, uh, again, a completely different uh, language of architecture, but at the same time, uh, going into a lot of technicalities in terms of user experience and buildability and so on. And this is a project from Fujairah in the UAE, uh, a luxury uh, spa resort, uh, which we have completed the conceptual designs now. Again, as part of the active uh, expansion that uh, we have been engaging in. And this is another uh, luxury residential project in Dubai. Uh, again, we have completed the conceptual designs and uh, approval drawings are in process through another collaborator. And uh, these are some of the Sri Lankan projects like I uh, spoke uh, mentioned before. Uh, as part of our diversification program, uh, another uh, interior turnkey projects company was formed and these are some of the apartment interior projects that company has completed in the last few months. And I have to also thank my team, uh, current and past, who have been with us for the last 15 years, who have worked tirelessly on some of these projects that I have shown you. But see, the bottom line is that this is only a tiny little small glimpse of uh, revival that we are seeing out of this minute amount of work that we have done in the past one and a half years. The actual opportunity is far larger, and the actual opportunities for everybody here, especially the young architects, young practices coming out to grab. So part two is about the opportunity. I will briefly take you through what I see as an opportunity, but each of, what I would invite is for each of you to use your uh, analytical thinking to identify the opportunities, get out of this uh, comfortable cocoon that we have been in. So the real opportunity, as I see it, is outside Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan opportunities are always there. And uh, as members of SLIA, we will always have those opportunities. So in the short term, what I'm proposing is everybody should start trying to identify brands and trying to identify alliances, creating your own brands, in terms of architecture and how you run your practice and forming alliances with like-minded people. In the short term, the idea is that Colombo should become a design center, a place that you go to get good design services done. And if that is done properly, the regional uh, design hub could end up being Colombo right now, the way one would think about Singapore, for example, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but of course, if that momentum is carried for a longer period, we'll also see that there are huge opportunities in the wider global context as well. So right now, I'm, for a simple analysis, we have concentrated on the Indian Ocean region. Indian Ocean region is basically the country that has a border to Indian Ocean and the countries that are right next to the Indian Ocean. As you would see, almost all the countries are developing countries. Some are a little wealthier than others. But they, are also, they also have a huge wealth of population. So if you just do a very simple analysis, you will see number of architects per million in most of these countries is less than in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, it's 75. Uh, 
India is there, Mauritius, which is a small country, is there, and Botswana. Those were the only other countries. According to available information that I found online, numbers are not exactly accurate, but number of architects per million is less in most of the other countries. And uh, even in most countries, such as the uh, GCC countries in the Middle East, have a lot of imported architects who are working there, who are employed there, but they are uh, homegrown number of architects or homegrown number of architects in their institutions is far less, or in most instances, not existing. So, the next part is what's beyond Kottu. Right now, when we say Kottu, what do you remember? You either get hungry, or you remember a bad case of diarrhea, or you remember uh, late nights uh, at university, something like that. So, right now, you had a nice meal, so you're probably none of you are hungry, probably you are thinking of the second thing. So, but although Kottu has been there for almost 40 years, nobody has made Kottu anything other than just a Kottu. If you go to Bambalapitiya shop and have a Kottu and then go to Peta, it's the same Kottu. If somebody brought you five Kottu and asked you whether you could do a blind taste test, nobody will be able to recognize one Kottu from the other because either they are all equally bad or they are all equally good. So this is where we should now start putting our extra efforts in to make the differentiation. Let's stop the, so that everybody doesn't make the same kottu. So part three is about a little blueprint. Oh, now, of course, many of you don't know even what blueprint is. So maybe A0 printout where we could start putting together certain things so that there is some sort of a plan that we could execute as architects, as designers. So what I'm proposing is something going beyond a BPO. It's not a BPO. We are not talking about uh, uh, doing individual uh, freelance work on Fiverr or any other similar platform, which a lot of the students are already doing because things are so tough, and they are sometimes earning more than the graduate or qualified architects in employment. It's not that. And it's not about providing some sort of a back-end technical service to some other bigger uh, business or a bigger design firm. What we are proposing is high quality design solutions delivered at world class standards. That capacity is there in Sri Lanka. That capacity is there in Sri Lankan architects. If you just look at, we have only 1,500 members. How many of these 1,500 odd members are working at really skilled levels overseas? That means the talent is already there. It's just a matter of getting the talent out and getting it into the right structure. So action one, establish your brand. If you are a new designer coming into the practice, identify, see what you are passionate about. See what drives you. See what sort of work makes you stay up whole night, but still not make you feel tired. Identify that. Then identify what your brand should be. Based on what you are passionate about, what you are good at, where your skills lie, your branding could be, it, it's, it's not some beautiful logo or some sort of a catchy name. Branding is something a lot more deeper than that. But your branding could come from the kind of architecture you practice, or it could come from kind of uh, 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 architectural language that you are passionate about. It could come from the kind of buildings. It could come from the type of materials. It could even come from the type of methodologies and processes that you engage in your practice. So that part is key. That is where you become something more than just a kottu. Once you have that, we need to start looking at branding ourselves, uh, basing ourselves, and of course, investing. When I say investing, it's not about investing millions and millions. But you will have to invest some amount of money. But Investing is more about investing your time, investing your energy. If that is done right, then you could main, go back to action two and start looking at establishing alliances. So if you already know what you're passionate about, if you're already committed and investing yourself into it, then it's about finding like-minded people, people who want to have the same passions like you, people who already have the same passions as you. Go out and Find that sort of people. They could be uh, uh, outsiders, they could be uh, designers, they could be international 
uh, individuals, then find out how to collaborate, and then how to develop lasting uh, alliances that could be mutually beneficial. So it can't be a one-way street. It's about us coming into an alliance where everybody gets the benefit. So it could be, like I said, like-minded interior designers, landscape architects, designers, industrial designers, engineers, anybody that has a passion for what you have a passion for. So these alliances should bring in the synergy. So it, it's more than what you could individually do or what another party could individually do. It's bringing in something a lot more than that. Action three, key role, business development. Not many architects know or actively engage that. You know, for architects or most of the other professionals, word of mouth is the key way of uh, uh, marketing. But word of mouth is not enough. Right now, that is not enough. Because word of mouth takes time to establish, and also the way the world markets work is not that. If you go and look at the 50, 50 largest design firms in the world, you would still see that they are engaging so much in business development. So that is a key area. We have to start reaching out to exhibitions, fairs, meetings, you name it. Try and get out of Sri Lanka and experience those. Have your communication ready. Your communication is absolute key from the elevator pitch, which is supposed to be, if you accidentally get into an elevator with a potential client, you should be able to market yourself in 15 seconds before the client gets off the next floor. To your profiles, to websites, to everything. Those things have to be ready. Then be aggressive. We as architects, and especially as Sri Lankans, we are taught not to self-promote. We feel a little shy about talking about our own achievements or talking about our own uh, grand plans. But what that happens is that in the Sri Lankan context, that's fine, because somebody who is bragging about their own work, we kind of dismiss them. Either they are talking too much about what they have done, or they have some other hidden agenda. But in the international context, that is not the case. Those who don't communicate about what they do and what they are passionate about will not get anywhere. So be aggressive about communicating and getting your message out. And don't wait for opportunities to come to you. Let's make this change. Let's go out and start creating opportunities for ourselves. If you see an opportunity in another country, Travel, meet with some inter uh, interesting people, talk to potential clients, talk to potential stakeholders, see whether you can create some opportunities out of those. Finally, action four, the delivery. OK, you could talk the talk, walk the walk, get your message out, impress people, all of that. But none of that will work unless you deliver what you promised. So always. Start looking at that, how to have the resources ready for delivery. Exceptional service, exceptional quality, and ideally exceed the client expectations, exceed the stakeholder expectations, and show commitment beyond just a business. It has to be where your passion started from. It has to follow through. It has to come through. Finally, train, educate, retrain, and retain. So training your team getting them to understand the culture, the values, the passion that you are bringing into your design is absolutely key. Your team has to understand that. For that to happen, you have to train them, you have to inspire them, then make sure you are, uh, they are treated well and they are retained, and continue the training. So if we do all of this, and if you are ready for the long haul, none of this will happen overnight. If you are ready to grind the grind and take the long path, things will start to become really good pretty soon. The thing to remember is that your practice is a growing business, especially for our young members and young practitioners. It's a growing business. You are just starting. This strategy, what you are forming, how you are branding yourself, will carry you through for the next 25 or 30 years. And architects don't have an age of retirement. Uh, you could practice until the day you 
drop dead while uh, doing a presentation like this. So, <laughs> uh, so finally, if things are done right, my friends, arrive at the world stage. The world is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gila. Um.